I was born in London and um, started being attracted sonically um, and I would say visually, uh, spiritually to the tabla. And I think a lot of that um, in terms of uh, cultural environment came from a kind of, I would say, uh, a liberal Sikh family, you know, going to the Gurdwara, even if it was just on a Sunday once a week, you know. Um, when I kind of first had my kind of initial kind of experience of listening to uh, spiritual music in the Gurdwara, it had a huge effect on me. And especially when I saw and heard tabla players, um, I thought it's one of the best kind of occupations one can have, you know, in terms of someone just with a kind of smiley face, just uh, sitting cross-legged and playing these drums and getting the most amazing sounds out of this instrument. And I think that had a huge impact on me um, uh, as a child. And I'm sure it kind of possibly was transposed by some kind of past energy. You know, it's not just a occupation which I just suddenly kind of um, realized and, uh, and kind of stipulated in my life. One of the things I kind of realized very early um, was my kind of cultural dual citizenship. Um, so I kind of made use of my, my Indianness and also my um, kind of urban English upbringing. So in, in London, um, I was always exposed to electronic music, Electro, which was kind of a parallel uh, genre to hip hop, uh, but more instrumental. And I was quite close to that. And also, you know, kids at that early age, in the, eight, the early 80s, um, you know, we, we were too young and possibly too brown uh, to get into clubs. Very early in my career, I started doing sessions. I became quite a successful session musician. So I would go and um, to studios and I would get paid for my kind of services towards uh, an album, whether it was a rock album, um, a pop album. So I did that for like a good, I would say seven years and, um, and did pretty well out of that at a very early age. I was really lucky because I always did a really good job as a percussionist, as a musician in the studio. So all the producers and the engineers loved me. And I'll ask them questions about certain equipment which was in the studio, like the Poltec EQs or the, 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 the analog compressors or the, or the mixing desk. Um, so I kind of learned quite a lot at that period about recording techniques. I was pretty much having fun, in a, you know, with confidence and, um, and with joy. And that led up to quite a bit of criticism from, um, from the Indian classical fraternity. 96 was when I first gave my kind of performance in India, you know, on a kind of mass level, like playing in front of thousands of people and then jumping on stage, presenting an award to Sting than playing with Sting, like early Channel V days. And at that time, that was a time when there was a lot of, I felt there was a lot of appreciation because what I was doing was really edgy and new. Um, but yet there was a minimal kind of, um, but quite potent criticism 
mainly coming from classical musicians, where they were like, no, we don't get this. Like, how, how is a tabla player valid? You know, how is it valid to kind of take these kind of uh, musical liberties? Like, you have uh, foot, like guitar foot pedals and processing, uh, which I was doing at that early, when I had designed the, the first electronic uh, I wouldn't say electronic tabla, but so I called it the doublatronics. And that took some kind of criticism because people, a lot of people didn't understand it or they were possibly overwhelmed by the idea. They couldn't get their head around it. But I still refused to take the blame for it all. You know, even though people kind of see me as like the kind of founder or um, of the style, but you know, there's no there's no style which is new in the world. So no artist can claim that I was the first to do this because everything's an amalgamation of 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 um, of unique things which have happened, and and you kind of you know you assimilate that as an artist, and then you kind of you know you you do your little thing. If you see the instrument itself, um, the repertoire of, of the Surabhara, it's much more closely related to Drupad. And Drupad music, you know, they say is believed to be Dal Pradam. So actually, the Dal is the king in Drupad music. vocalists, the Drupal Dia vocalists and instrumentalists, if there was a senior, and usually that was the case, there was a senior Bukharaji accompanying them, they would go and touch the feet of the Bukharaji before they actually started tuning or playing. So in terms of like, um, being a percussionist, you know, Surbahar, um, you know, after the, the alab sequence of the Nandalal, then you get, you do get into a rhythmic zone, you get into a rhythmic frenzy, and, uh, and so that really does help if, if you know rhythm and if you know percussion. said well when you when it's actually tuned there's two things you should hear in the instrument is you should, the overtones you should hear bells like temple bells everywhere and at times you'll also hear bird singing in the temple bells so that's why they have this lovely kind of ornate work and Creature in, in its kind of 
the equity group. Um, I don't think So it also represents that in terms of it can swim through the ocean because the, it's so vast. Um, and for me, the Surbahar is like a meditation instrument. It's an instrument which is not a performing instrument for me. It's an instrument which I kind of prepare myself to even play tabla now, where I, re I relax myself um, with the surbaha. Not that I don't relax myself with the tabla, but I enjoy the preparation, the melodic preparation, and then sitting on the tabla. When I see, uh, you know, kind of commercial pop music, and then I see Indian classical, um, kind of pyrotechnic driven music, I kind of see that in one room now, you know, where I, I, I feel like a lot of Indian classical music uh, musicians are kind of um, almost encouraged to to, to perform for the gallery um, where, you know, you, you perform a certain um, aspect of the repertoire and, 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 and the audience is expected to, to applaud and clap at that given point. And I, I, I kind of today feel that's far removed from, uh, uh, from, from the original idea. kind of look at my kind of environment in terms of uh, sonic art I kind of see you know two pretty kind of clear elements of that one is the kind of Vedic music uh, the healing aspect of music the spiritual self-realization through the means and the medium of sound and music which we see as um, as Nad Grandma Nad Yog. And when I see that aspect of, um, of art and music and the electronic sonic art and the kind of the practice of, um, of um, sonic artistic ideas and discipline, um, i.e. electronic music um, in its kind of modular synth synthesis form, um, or digital art form, then I, I kind of see them very in the same room, almost, you know? I like the idea of... the idea of having a form, a strong form, in my work, um, but yet enjoying, like, freedom within that form. And I think I've got that inspiration from Indian classical music, where, you know, if, what, it, when, when we look at a rag, there's a, a stipulated, um, selected um, 
notes or frequencies in the scale. And there's a way of kind of ascending, going up in the scale, and there's a way of descending. But within that kind of framework and structure, you're pretty much given the freedom to sometimes even take liberty. Yeah, and if you take liberty, if you know it really well, if you, if you get to know the form really well, and you take liberties, then I think that's when you become an artist and not just a, um, you know, just a textbook artist of that particular repertoire where you're, you're just repeating what you've learned. I think one of the kind of um, major assets I've had in my my life um, is the exposure um, to India at a very early age. My mother was born in a place in central India, I would say in, in Bilaspur, which is now in the state of uh, Chhattisgarh, and which was then Madhya Pradesh MP. I think the first visit to India, I think I was five years old, and I think your eyes and your sensory board just opens up at that age. And being in that kind of part of India, I felt, I felt this real incredible energy at this place in Amarkanta. And it felt like I've, I'm familiar with it. It felt like I know it and I've been there before. And I started recording some sounds while I was there, some field recordings. I had a couple of field recorders with me and I started field recording. I already had started these compositions. Uh, one of them was actually started as a tribute to Pandit Ravi Shankarji. So I had around about five compositions and I didn't really know where to place them. And at that time in Amarkantik, I started thinking about those compositions and I felt that they belong to this journey which I was realizing of the oh, Narmada okay. River, which is a kind of almost, in, you would say, an incarnated uh, Saraswati, Saraswati River, which apparently dried out. Oh, so for me, Narmada, also in terms of uh, the kind of production line, you know, has a certain value. Because I've taken care in recording things in the way I would like things to be recorded and how I would like uh, the, the kind of listeners and the audience to experience uh, in terms of sound staging, how you can close your eyes and you would feel um, a kind of self sonic reality where if you close your eyes you would kind of feel you're, you're actually positioned right in front of the happening.
that that was yeah, five. Yes. That was five five levels. Yeah. D it depends on the kind of cycle. But I'll do it a few times. Then we can we can change mm -hmm. because I'm not used to with uh, usually with double front. You get to be more free with your hands.